What I want to try and do in the next 10 minutes is to convince you that it's possible to imagine a world in which in about 100 years time there are no border controls between countries, no visas, no passports, no border guards, no need for any of these things. This would be an incredible increase in freedom. Not being allowed to move freely between countries and over borders is a decrease in freedom. But it's an increase in freedom that you probably think is fanciful, impossible, uh, maybe detrimental, maybe a terrible thing to occur. Why on earth would you want a world without border controls? The first thing to realise when somebody's arguing about border controls is that border controls are incredibly recent. The vast majority of the world did not have border controls, passports or visas a hundred years ago. In 1911 you could freely move around Europe, no matter who you were, you didn't need a bit of paper to say who you were. There were border controls within uh, particularly um, pernicious empires. The Ottoman Empire had passports within the Ottoman Empire. The Russian Empire had that then similarly had internal border controls. But border controls between countries were not seen as greatly necessarily 100 years ago and then they began to come in. They came in particularly quickly with the First World War in Europe and then they spread from being popular in Europe to being popular in much of the world. And now almost everywhere has border controls. The reason for the introduction of border controls wasn't just the First World War and the worry about controlling population during war. It was increased economic inequality between countries. Rich countries becoming richer, poorer countries becoming poorer, and a fear that people would move from poorer countries to rich countries. That fear was made worse by the realisation, the beginning of the realisation, that human population was growing very, very rapidly. Human population had only got to a billion people by 1820, and it had taken a long time, maybe 65,000 years, to get to that billion people. 1820 was the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. It was the beginning of the har har harnessing of coal power, uh, the beginning of, of factories, of machines, and the beginning of all those changes that made population explosion possible. So the population went up most in Europe, first of all, after 1820. But that increase from Europe spread around the world. By 1926, just over 100 years later, the population of the world had doubled to about 2 billion. And it was towards the end of that period of doubling that immigration controls began to start in earnest around the world. It wasn't just that the population had doubled, but it was evident that it was continuing to increase very, very quickly. The population reached 3 billion people by 1960. That was just 34 years later. It reached 4 billion people by 1974, just 14 years later. It reached 5 billion people by 1987, just 13 years later. It reached 6 billion people by 1999, just 12 years later, for an extra billion people. And just another 12 years later, it's said to have reached 7 billion people, or will reach 7 billion people towards the end of this year, towards the end of 2011. This is the fastest acceleration of human population that has ever happened in the world. And as the numbers of people have increased and increased most in the countries which are poorest, and as the gap between countries has widened and rich countries have become richer and poor countries have been, become poorer, so the controls have become stronger and stronger and stronger between countries to try to prevent people moving. And this is part of the reason why I say we can imagine a world without border controls in a hundred years' time because that population increase is beginning to slow and the economic inequality be between countries is beginning to slow and maybe even reverse also. The latest United Nations projections for population suggest that in about 13 years time, by 2025, we shall get up to 8 billion people and then in 18 years time, by 2043, we'll get up to 9 billion people and then in 40 years after that, 2083, 71 years from now, we'll get up to 10 billion people. That's the rapid slowing down of the increase, and the population is predicted never to rise much above 10 billion. Even that projection may be an overestimate. It's based on current trends which are influenced by a mini worldwide baby boom. The population of the world might never rise above 9.5 or 9 or even 8.5 billion people. But what we do know is it's rapidly slowing down. Most people in the world at the moment have three children. Most couples have three children. The UN projections suggest that their children are projected each 
to have two children. That's the end of population rises. Well, since the last time population rise stopped ending, which was of the Black Death. It's a long time ago with Black Death. We know from the Black Death that the value of labour and the bottom of the labour market increased, that people became seen as more useful, they were paid more. That this economic gap between human beings reduces when there are fewer people to be exploited at the bottom. And when there's greater need for people amongst those living in rich countries which are ageing. At the same time, the difference in average wealth and average wages between countries is beginning to reduce. It's only happened relatively recently. For most of the period since 1820 that gap was growing. But now the gap between rich and poor countries on average is reducing ever so slightly. The gap between average incomes in China and average incomes in the USA. The gap between average incomes across the European Union or average incomes across Africa. It's a huge gap, but that gap is beginning to reduce. Inequalities within countries continue to rise, but inequalities between countries are falling. And it's inequalities between countries which is the reason for border controls. Hold it, you might say. If you get rid of border controls, even if you are beginning to get a slowdown in the number of people worldwide, and are beginning to get a slowdown, even a reversal in economic inequality worldwide, surely you're just going to see people flooding into rich countries from poor countries. Well, one thing we've learned about immigration controls is they don't actually work. What immigration controls do is cause a great deal of inconvenience for a great many people. They stop certain people being able to get in, people who might be wanting to get in through legitimate channels, and create more spaces for people who come in illegally to actually find work or other things in the countries that they move to. There's no evidence that immigration controls actually stop the overall number of people who might want to get into a country um, from getting in, because people move around the world at an incredible rate. What's more, immigration into rich countries is much higher if the rich country is unequal. That is, if the rich country has many people who are on very low wages, a few people on average wages, and a tiny number who are very rich. Those more unequal rich countries attract many more immigrants from poor countries because there are many more poorly paid jobs for them to do. The classic example is the United States of America. In the United States of America, people who, ca who come, say, from Mexico, the largest country of immigrant source to the USA, around about 70% of them are said to leave within three or four years and go back to those parts of Mexico, often the poorer parts of Mexico from which they came, because they find that the streets were not actually paid for gold like they were told when they arrived. And they also begin to work out that their prospects for the future are not going to be that good in somewhere like the USA. So the experience we currently have of migration between countries, of people's immigration experiences and emigration experiences, suggests that you don't necessarily get a great flood um, of immigrants coming. People move around anyway, they settle where there are opportunities, they leave where there aren't opportunities, and they don't arrive if there aren't places for them to fit into in the first place. There's enormous fear of immigration. In the United Kingdom, there are constant stories about how immigrants are going to swamp the country, are going to fill up the country, there isn't enough space for them, population projections are dominated with them. What we hear much less of are stories that say every time we take a population census, we actually find there's a million fewer people in Britain than we thought there were. And one reason for this is that we're not very good at recalling people leaving because we're not obsessed by emigration. But just as people leave the United States and they find that it's not as great as they think it is to go there, people leave the United Kingdom as well, quietly and often without much of a fanfare to say that they're leaving. Um, it really is silly to fear immigration. It is silly to think that immigration controls actually work. But it's also silly, I think, to think we'll always have to have them or feel we need to have them. Because of what I've just described about world population, changes and because of the changes we're expecting to happen in inequalities between countries in the world. The real question is that how long does it take people to overcome their fears, to begin to realise that it makes sense to have larger areas of the free movement of labour, to begin to realise it makes sense to allow people to move around easier than we currently do, to work out that immigration controls don't actually stop people coming, they just tend to stop who comes.
and you get more people coming who might not necessarily want the more stronger the immigration controls you put in are. If you want one last reason to think it could be possible to have the freedom in a hundred years time of living in the world without immigration and border controls and visas and passports and so on, try and think of something that was similarly as fanciful over 100, 150 years ago which has come to pass and then think well how did that come to pass and how could this come to pass. My favourite example of something which is just as hard or was just as hard to imagine then as it is to imagine a world without borders now is the idea say 150 years ago of giving women the vote. Women now have the vote in almost every country where people have the vote and at the moment around about 180 maybe up to depending on what you call democracy 190 countries in the world people have the vote. If you'd said 150 years ago or even 100 years ago that women would have the vote on an equal basis to men in almost every country in the world, people wouldn't have believed you. But you could have looked at the trends and you could have said that this is how things are going, this is where women have to vote to begin with, this is how it's altering, this is what's likely to happen in the future, and you could have made a prediction and said this is possible. Wouldn't mean it would happen. What got women to vote was a lot more work than somebody just saying it's possible. But without people thinking it's possible, you don't get the agitation that makes it happen. Similarly, with immigration, population control, border controls, passports and visas, if you don't think it's possible to have a world in a hundred years' time, rather like the world a hundred years ago, in which these controls are not in place, you're going to kind of find it quite hard to do the work and the arguing to begin to dismantle the controls we have to get to a point where we all have the freedom to move around to see where we think we each best fit in. Thank you.